the iPhone has profoundly changed our lives, perhaps even more than Apple's co-founder and CEO Steve Jobs could have imagined when he unveiled it in January 2007. Ask anyone who owns one, and they'll tell you, whatever they need, there's probably an app for that. The iPhone is an integral part of my daily life and my business. I couldn't imagine life without it. I am waiting for the time when we'll have skin grafts that will be the new iPhone. The iPhone not only made my life easier, it makes me a more confident person. I was a young adult when I got one. I was able to navigate a city that I'd never been to. Any questions I didn't know the answer to, I could look up online. I do my online banking and uh, other things, and uh, Facebook, and so I'm not running to the library to use your computer when uh, only when they're open. The iPhone changed my life in a way where my kids no longer talk to me other than on text messaging. How did the iPhone come to be? And how are we doing with all this change? Let's discuss so in order, we, you know, everything's kind of shifted to where we expect to be able to do everything immediately. Other people have this expectation of us, so it all of a sudden seems like you're just thrown way out of sync if you can't respond to a text message in 10 seconds, or if you can't find the nearest Starbucks to, to meet somebody immediately. You know, it's, it, it really kind of sets you uh, apart and you, you kind of you know, lose your bearings in a way that's really interesting to me. And you, you kind of you know, lose your bearings in a way that's really interesting to me. Jennifer emailed us from Syracuse. Smartphones poured down on us without notice from the digital heavens. 10 years later, we are waking up to the consequences, not all positive. We've grown sedentary and inattentive, for instance. Social media, such as Facebook, now has enormous power over how we structure our lives. Manush Zavarodi, I wonder if, if you view the advent of the iPhone kind of the way Jennifer does, as this blindsiding influence that we're still not quite sure how to navigate. Yeah, it's interesting to hear Brian's story about how he sort of woke up to the power of the iPhone, if you will. Um, for me, uh, my son and the iPhone were actually born exactly uh, three weeks apart in 2007. Wow. And so, yeah, so happy birthday to them both. But um, for me, I think I had, there was a profound change that happened in me as a parent, and I sort of was awakened to then watching how the iPhone was changing the world around me. I really had to slow down because I had a baby, and I was really watching how it radically changed how parents um, behaved at the playground, both for good and bad. You know, it was, I think as a new parent, you feel very isolated, and then suddenly when people started to have smartphones, we could all meet at Starbucks. We could all find each other even though nap times were all different, or we could look up and see was the library actually open. And but yes, like your listener, Jennifer said, there was also the bad side, which is that mommy's staring at her phone or daddy's staring at her phone and then the kid falls off the jungle gym. We've all sort of been there and been like, oh man, that was fail, epic right. fail on my part as mommy. So I think for me it was, um, and it really, that is what launched um, my career essentially, was looking at how technology was changing our, the sociology of us, how it was changing the way that we parent, how it was changing the way that we fall in love, how it was the, changing the way we get to work, how it was changing the work that we did once we even got there, if we even went to work, because we didn't need to do all those things anymore. We could be simultaneously in two different places. And I think for me, um, as a working mom that was very empowering at first um, I could be with my kids and on a conference call and then you know we've we've seen in the last couple of years I think that the honeymoon is sort of over and we're like actually I don't think I like being mentally in two different places at once and I don't think my brain can actually do that and instead of um, being very present in either place I, I feel distracted all the time I'm constantly interrupted um, and and there are these downsides to right. it what is it like for you as a mom to know that your child will never grow up in a world without an iPhone? Yeah, it is a little bit shocking to me. Uh, it's the end of school year here, and they were the school was saying, you know, if your kid wants to bring in an iPad to play in class um, at the end of the year, and all the parents just 
revolted and said, absolutely not. And you have to wonder, is it because we're all kind of Gen X or millennials who do remember a time before the iPhone where the kids are kind of mystified, like, why are we so up in arms? It's just what you do. Right. Um, but I think what we've seen also is that, um, and, and experienced it ourselves as adults, is we don't sleep as well if we have too much iPhone before bed. We uh, lose track of what's going on around us. We bump into people. Literally, that happened to me this morning. A dude, like, walked into me while he was looking at his phone. Huh. Um, so I, I think we're a little bit frightened to think that if our kids don't realize that self-regulation is incredibly important right. when it comes to this very powerful device that we might be leaving something behind. Starting with Wendy in Birmingham, Alabama. Hi, Wendy. What's on your mind? Hi, good morning. Um, I am especially interested in what she just said about how it affects relationships. Um, I've been a, a device user, I should say, since 1995. I was in San Francisco in graduate school, and I watched that whole industry just explode. Wired Magazine was like once every three months, and then people were on AOL, and you can hear that little modem. <laughs> so I've always been pro-device. But I moved back to Birmingham and got on Facebook, you know, about 2007, 2008. And um, about six years ago, I met someone online in a discussion on a thread, and he lives in London. And it's become this daily interaction in my life where it's almost as if she was talking about the isolation. I work as a graphic designer at home, I have kids, I'm divorced, and so I'm isolated a lot. And he uh, was at home a lot as an English uh, professor, and um, we would correspond and talk to each other every day about meals and cooking and recipes. It's like he's down the block, yeah. but he's not. He's not down the block. And it's sort of... It really sort of messed up my head a little bit, if you would say, uh, in a relationship, because I wasn't really free and wasn't allowing myself to meet other people who were closer in proximity to where I live. Right, but it and closes so the distance. At the end of the day, go ahead. But it closes the distance a lot. It did. It helped with the um, it helped with loneliness. I would say that. But then at the end of the day, when I would turn off the phone or say good night, there's nobody there. Yeah. It, 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 I would look around, and you know, I'm still in my same circumstances. Right. And, you know, it, it's a false sense of, I don't know if it's a false sense of being connected right. in one way. Um, at we, some point... We well, you know, Wendy, I'm, I'm sorry to cut you short. Here's a clip of the original introduction of the iPhone. This was Steve Jobs unveiling the device on stage in January of 2007. And everyone kind of knew the announcement was building up to something big, but it seems no one realized just how big. Three things. A widescreen iPod with touch controls, a revolutionary mobile phone, and a breakthrough internet communications device. An iPod, a phone, and an internet communicator. An iPod, a phone. Three separate devices. This is one device. And we are calling it iPhone. That was Steve Jobs unveiling the iPhone to the world in January of 2007. Brian, do you think that Steve Jobs, the late Steve Jobs, had an inkling of just how big the iPhone would be? I don't. He had to be talked into doing a phone at all. Um, was to combine the iPod and, and a phone to sort of get ahead of the competition. And his engineers really lobbied for this idea of, of adding a, a, a web browser. Um, so they had this revolutionary interface that they could add to that mix. But I think, you know, as you mentioned earlier, there, there were no uh, outside apps uh, on the phone in the beginning. So it wasn't even sort of envisioned as this open sort of ecosystem where you could do all this stuff. It was envisioned as a really about, new Ryan. phone. Yeah. Well, Steve Jobs was really uh, keen on this idea of being able to control the entire system. And adding an app store would mean opening it up to developers and then potentially adding all these functionalities that he couldn't necessarily uh, control. This kind of skunk works operation worked in an unused building on Apple's campus in Cupertino, California, playing around with multi-touch, but they kept it secret, kind of even from Steve Jobs. They wanted to nail it and get it just right before he saw it, because they knew they would only get one shot. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. 
So the iPhone uh, really began as this kind of freewheeling research project, sort of deep in the bowels of, of Apple HQ in this abandoned user testing lab. Uh, you know, it was just a handful of designers and engineers really just kind of messing around and, and really, you know, fixating on this idea that, you know, around the, the turn of the century, computers were getting faster, the internet was carrying richer media, uh, so things were really getting to the point where they figured people would want a new way to interact with all this sort of bounty, this richness of data and information and, and, and media. So they really started trying to explore alternative ways to interact with it besides the mouse and the keyboard, which was dominant at the time, and they came up with, uh, you know, this idea of touching, of, of multi-touch, which was then this niche, tiny technology that had just kind of slowly emerged under the consumer market. And they sort of gravitated to this, uh, and, and they really started fixating on that as, as the sort of the vessel to, to, to the future. And so I think what it did was it launched, uh, it changed not only um, how we communicate, what we communicate, the idea that we are all networked, the texture of our everyday lives. Um, we now do things where we rate people, where we rate people, um, and, 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 and got rid of so many physical objects in our lives too. I mean, I do not miss carrying around a calendar and an address book at all. I still have a drawer of CDs, which is, you know, worthless, and I haven't <laughs> taken anything out of that drawer in at least five years. Um, I also don't miss carrying around a separate camera because I always used to forget it. I mean, all of these things that we used to lug around with us, it is quite sleek and wonderful to have it all with us at the same time. But having said that, it also um, kind of unnerves me when I see uh, a bunch of kids unable to do something without stopping to smile and take selfies and document the moment. Um, there is this sort of performance-based um, thing that also really kicked off um, just a couple years later after the iPhone came out um, when, when Facebook really took off. Which Karen tweets, as a social activist, my phone and apps have revolutionized how we organize, speak truth to power, and do battle in socio-political discourse. Joshua tweets, personally don't like the iPhone. Appreciate it's being the father of the modern smartphone, but give me an Android over an iPhone any day. Teresa emails, the biggest thing with the iPhone that I hate to admit, I rarely read anymore. I play puzzle games, and I'm an English teacher. Oh, the shame. And the signature line of her email says, sent from my iPhone. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's, as soon as we had the telephone, really, people started thinking about uh, how we could get, you know, uh, visuals into the mix. Uh, you know, you had futurists and satirists imagining the telephonoscope, uh, ways to pipe in, uh, you know, maybe a play from Paris uh, to anywhere in the world, or a way to keep in touch with your kids when they were away at summer camp. And you have some really, really thorough sort of uh, future predictions and uh, even satire of this idea of ever connectedness through devices. Um, there's one uh, political cartoon that I really love and that I include in the book where it's, uh, it, it's I guess it's less a political cartoon than a, like a, a social satire and it's a married couple and they're sitting in, in their goofy, you know, top hats and they're all decked out uh, and they're angled away from each other staring at devices and he's looking at a horse race on his very conspicuously uh, phone-esque uh, device and and she's uh, browsing uh, you know I, I think she's supposed to be shopping or something and the critique of course is that they're not paying attention to each other on this uh, fine picnic day so we knew even then a hundred years ago, there was this critique of the attention uh, economy, the distraction economy, uh, and, and it, you know, there was actually imaginations of the device that looked a lot like the iPhone, you know, your rectangular screen-based thing that had popped up a lot, and in fact, the first smartphone, the first touchscreen-based app-oriented uh, device that was actually built and actually released to the public was in the early 90s. Uh, by a guy named Frank Canova Jr., who holds the first patent for, for the smartphone. Uh, and it was released by IBM, uh, and it tanked because the internet uh, connectivity wasn't there yet. The processing power wasn't quite enough, but he told me the story when I interviewed him uh, of how he sold his bosses at IBM on this idea. Mm -hmm. And one of his associates went down uh, to his office, sat down and brought a big bag full of stuff, and it, he pulled out a map. 
and he plopped it on the table. He pulled out an address book and he plopped it on the table and he said, look, this device isn't just going to be a phone. It's going to do this. And he pulled out the map and he pulled out a game and there's this big sack full of stuff. And he said, you know, this is not going to be 10 devices. This is going to be one device. And that was 15 years before the advent of the first or the releasing of the first iPhone. So this idea that we want to have this device that can connect us, that can perform multiple functions, and we want to just you know consolidate all this activity has been around for quite some time. You're not going to have that port anymore. Nope, you're going to use it on Bluetooth. Nope, we're going to invent something new, and you're just going to buy it. Right. Yeah. Well, I want to start by saying that uh, yeah, that that uh, that's that was that was a great story to hear, and I and I, I'm I'm really glad uh, that he brought it up because Apple deserves immense amounts of credit for really focusing on some of those accessibility. Uh, issues, the, the iPhone and the iPad, the whole iOS operating system has a bunch of great accessibility features for the, the hearing and, and, and visually impaired especially. It's really cool that they've taken the time and the effort to really make it a cool device for everybody. Let me get to one more email before we have to pause. Carrie emailed, I have type 1 diabetes and have a continuous glucose monitor inserted in my arm. It reads my blood sugar every five minutes and relays it to the app on my phone. That's right, there's an app for that. It's kind of amazing how much the iPhone has intertwined with people's lives, literally their lives and their health. Yes, and I think that, that what, what both of your callers are saying is where the future um, real benefits are when it comes to health and monitoring our fitness. Um, my dad has atrial fib and is able to track his heart rate because of it. There are amazing, amazing things that are being done in the health sector as well. Um, on the flip side of that, of course, is the privacy implications as to who gets to own our personal information and our data and who gets to track where we are at all times. And um, I've started getting these really sort of invasive ads on my phone for insurance asking me if I'm a runner. Um, I can only guess that it maybe it knows that yes, I am a runner. <laughs> so, um, and I think, you know, as we get deeper into this, this sort of next decade, that's where we need to start saying, okay, it's time to draw up some rules around the data and information going in and out of these wonderful gadgets. Gabriella tweets, what is the biggest dirty secret of the iPhone? Brian? Well, I'm gonna break a cardinal rule here and say that there just, there has to be two. Now the first, is uh, in regards to, to the mining and the collecting of the raw materials that uh, makes up the iPhone. We, you know, in the course of reporting this book, we, we pulverized one to find out what exactly it was made up of, and there are dozens of elements uh, that come from all over the world. Um, and they come from uh, mines and places where it's really difficult to uh, obtain some of this stuff. Uh, and just because of the way that the supply chain is set up right now, uh, that means that there's not always a lot of oversight. So in some cases, uh, like in one of the mines that I visited where, where Apple sources some of its tin from, uh, there are indeed uh, child miners uh, who are procuring some of this stuff. And it's just really hard to clamp down on uh, from Apple's perspective, but it's also really uh, you know, tragic what a lot of these children, you know, the UN did a report on mining in the region and found that children as young as six were in there um, you know, digging out, especially tin, is what's left in these, these old, very dangerous, deadly mines. Um, and then if you step up the supply chain just a little bit, you know, all these component parts that lurk behind the screen in the iPhone need to be assembled uh, somewhere, and that somewhere is in China, uh, where there are city-sized factories uh, run by Foxconn, which is Apple's biggest manufacturing supplier, and they run these factories that came under fire back in 2010 and 2011 for having such harsh conditions that they led to uh, suicide epidemics by the workers. The conditions were so harsh um, that people felt that they had no other choice but to make a sort of a public protest of their death. Um, but they, you know, there are other things that they could do. You know, they make an immense profit margin on every phone that they sell. That's one of the highest in the industry. Um, they could make adjustments to the way that they procure their labor. They could make certain demands without derailing their entire business model. Uh, they'd be relatively uh, small changes, even, uh, if, if, in the scheme of things. Uh, if, if, that, if they really decided that that was something that they wanted to do, they could in, install uh, much stricter safeguards uh, and demand more from Foxconn, audit a little more thoroughly. Uh, will they do it? I don't know. Uh, on the mining front, they've come out and said that their hope is that one day that they hope to not do any mining at all. 
and ostensibly source all of their materials from uh, recycled uh, feedstocks and e-waste and that kind of thing. Uh, but there's no plan in place to do that, uh, at, at least not yet. Let's keep going on the phones now with Ruth in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Hi, Ruth. What's on your mind? Hi, I'm a high school teacher in Hillsboro, North Carolina. I find that my students, my high school students, are absolutely, utterly attached to their smartphones. It's, it's like an addiction. It, it is an addiction. Our school doesn't have a policy for phones in the classroom, so it's up to teachers to make up their own individual policies, for, which means we're sort of a one at a time um, kind of facing our students, and it, it pits us as teachers almost against students. It makes it, makes it harder for us to win them over. Um, that, uh, so teachers, kids text, they listen to music, they check their email, they check their grades, they Snapchat their teachers, they make comments about their teachers and their Snapchats to their friends. It's difficult to compete with that level of stimulation, and it's just very hard for us to build a community of focused, mindful learners the way we maybe want to. Have you been? Have you made any efforts to try to maybe integrate some of their phones or digital devices into the classroom? Maybe putting some activities or using apps through their iPhones so they can't multitask. Uh, yes, very much. I, I guess what it is is really it's not having them not multitask. It's more like multitasking with them. And yes, very definitely, we sort of have to. I mean, you can't beat them. You have to join them, so you have to include that. So they can use calculators on their on their phones. They can sometimes they have a, a device where they can kind of vote on a particular question. So you can find out from your students what do they all think about this particular question, whatever it might be. Um, it could be an opinion question. It could be a science question, whatever it might be. Um, they can also look up information. You know, sometimes a student might be, you think that they're off task, and all of a sudden they raise their hand and they say, I, you know, I just found out that such and such, and it's something that's quite enlightening to the conversation I've ever left in that hand. So, yeah, we have to go in that direction in order to keep them really engaged. That's the only way. And yet I feel that that, that the multitasking and the constant um, pull for them in all those directions makes it much, much more difficult to teach. And I think the, one of the hardest things about it is it makes it hard for them to retain. Mm -hmm. So the next day, did they are they able to build on that the information and the concepts in the previous day? Much less so than ever before. So right. I feel like this kind of fragmenting of their ability to integrate what we're learning is, is really compromised. Yeah. Well, Ruth, I appreciate you calling in. Thanks very much. Let's continue on the phones with Margaret in Centerville, Virginia. Hi, Margaret. What's on your mind? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm a communication teacher, and there's two points I want to make. One, there's an anecdote I used to tell my students about six years ago uh, when my fourth grade daughter walked in the house one day after school and she was sweet on a boy and a boy was sweet on her and he would walk her home. And she goes, I don't know about him. And I said, why? And she said, he doesn't talk to me. We were sitting right next to each other around the curb and I would talk, say something to him and he would text me his answer. And, and we were right next to each other. And I would use this example of how I believe that this technology is improving uh, our competency for interpersonal communication. Now, years ago, my students would kind of giggle over it. They don't giggle over it anymore. They shake their head yes, and they know exactly what I'm talking about. Right, Margaret, I'm, and, I'm sorry to cut you short. Your phone line is a little hard to hear. But let's see if we can squeeze in one more quick phone call from Scott here in Washington, D.C. Hi, Scott. What's on your mind? Well, I just spent the last hour or so trying to get out, make sure my communications with us are well working because I had a uh, bill mixed up with Comcast. And the thing is that whether you got a, an iPhone or you've got a cable TV or you've got a uh, cell phone, you, you always have to be paying some kind of money just to be able to communicate with the, with the outside world. And if you, if you uh, went to opt out and start paying those fees, you're going to have a very different kind of existence. Yeah, Scott, I do take your point. Thanks for calling in. Brian, what about that? Yeah, I mean, it, it's also sort of scrambled the, uh, you know, the, the systems uh, of, of, of buying. Now, there are all these things that we are expected to be, you know, paying uh, a, a a service, you know, paying for paying for a service, paying for, for a network, and paying a carrier is, is a new and more important uh, bill that we all pay, but I think it's also interesting that there's all these other sort of new services that, that a lot of people are expected to buy into as part of their work. You know, we're expected 
to be uh, on email. We might necessarily not have to pay you know, a cost to, to load Gmail, but we're paying a different sort of cost by being expected to answer emails at 10 p.m. because now we know that everybody has access to it. Right. So there are all sorts of new sort of, you know, economic and uh, and social costs that have come along with the rest of the iPhone. Yeah. I mean, it, it's also sort of scrambled the, uh, you know, the, the systems uh, of, of, of buying. Now, there are all these things that we are expected to be, you know, paying uh, a, a service, you know, paying uh, a, a a service, you know, paying uh, a, a